My name is Charlotte Thompson Miserbade, and I served as Senior Policy Advisor in the United States Department of Education uh, under the Reagan administration, during which I had access to uh, all of the most important documents uh, for the restructuring of not only American education, but uh, global education. And I'm also the author of The Deliberate Dumbing Down of America, which gets into all of this, gives the background of what I saw not only in the Department of Education, but as a local school board member. I was trained uh, to identify the resistors. The resistors to the sex ad, drug ad, alcohol ad, uh, suicide ad, death ad, those good, smart Americans who realize that anything that has education hanging off the end of it is probably not what they're looking for. Uh, I was trained to identify those good people and uh, to go up against them and actually to go and try to get them to join us through the group process system, make them feel important, get them on a committee. And when I, that just blew my mind. I, I have to say, people often ask me, what is it that got you involved in education? Well, finding out what, what I saw at the local level certainly upset me. When I went and I saw that Americans were being trained to identify resistors, yeah, you know, then I, uh, I got pretty upset. And uh, luckily, there was a big book that came with the in-service training called Innovations in Education, A Change Agent's Guide. And uh, I was able to take that back home with me. Unbelievable examples of how to con the Christians and different people who are upset with what you're trying to do how to bring them over to your side, case studies, true case studies of educators who had put programs in that uh, normally, you know, in a normal American town, nobody would want them. How did they manage to get them in? How did they con the people? And the other thing was not only was I trained to identify the resistors, I was trained to go to the important people, uh, high profile, highly thought of people in the community uh, with the Rotary and Chamber of Commerce, uh, garden club, you name it, the different groups in our towns. Go to them and convince them of the importance of these new programs like sex ed, drug ed, I just men mentioned all of them, and to get them on your side because when you can get the leadership in a community to go along with it, then the newspaper comes in and says, you know, a committee's been set up with the head of the Rotary and this and that and they're all getting behind this task force to Dis discuss whether we're going to have a new sex education program. And then when Mary Jones, you know, who ordinarily would think, why would we want to have a sex education program when we don't have any problems with kids having sex or anything? Uh, so she might be, uh, you know, concerned. She might be one of the resistors. She reads that her best friend, who's the head of the garden club, is on this committee, and she thinks, oh, well, hey, Mary, Mary uh, Appleton is on that committee. She's heading it up. It must be okay. So I was taught, really, how to con the community. They always call everybody by the first name. You have to get very, you know, affectionate with people and say, William, you know, I'm so glad you've come to this meeting, and I understand your concerns about this program because, uh, you know, I've had other people, that usually it's the really bright people in the community who have these concerns. And would you like to join our, our group? The original program was uh, funded by my, what, be, what would subsequently become my office. It was funded by the Office of Research in the U.S. Office of Education, because it was funded early on, about the late 60s. Still funded, by the way. And uh, the money went to the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor to a professor by the name of Ronald Havelock. And he was the one that uh, put together the whole training, the whole seminar, the book. And in the back of the book you had, they admitted it, right in the back of the book they had about 100 major change agents listed from all over the country. Some of them I recognize, some I still don't, but some I do. And so this was a very important project. And uh, it was being, you know, it was being carried out in our, I'm sure, all over the country, not just where I was. But this was in Searsport, Maine, this lovely little town on the coast of Maine, in the school there where they were, where they, the guy came in, the facilitator, not Mr. Havel, not Professor Havelock, but a facilitator, uh, to train us. And these were good people that were there. You know, they were some of the teachers from my school, where I was on the local school board, principals. Etc. Normal looking Americans, uh, you know, you really ask yourself, they must themselves have reacted 
very much the way I did. That's why I've always had uh, a lot of um, understanding for teachers that have to go through this stuff. I didn't have to continue going through it. They've had to, through the years, constant training, retraining, sensitivity training, break their values. Right, no right, no wrong. You've got to have all, all religions represented, so, you know, tolerant of everything, and because that's the new world order. Disorder, excuse me. Professor Benjamin Bloom is probably the most important behavioral psychologist ever to live. I mean, maybe not quite as much as Pavlov and Skinner, but he really implemented the system in education in the United States. And uh, he was the, fa the um, author of uh, The Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. And I know that doesn't mean much to us. It means a lot to teachers. They know. All teachers have to go through that. Bloom's Taxonomy. And uh, just to give you an idea of how blatant they are, uh, Benjamin Bloom uh, said the purpose of education and I often say this to parents, really, listen to this. You think the purpose of education is reading, writing, and arithmetic? The purpose of education is to change the thoughts, actions, and feelings of students. And then he goes on and he says, um, he defines good teaching, and this is even worse from the parental standpoint, as challenging the students' fixed beliefs. And then, in some of his works that I have, that are in my book, a lot of this stuff is in When he says challenge, does he mean challenge or does he mean change? Change their fix? Yeah, through challenging. It's through challenging. You go up against them and you, you, you change them. And you asked a good question because then he goes on in one part of the taxonomy that is in my book. Uh, he says that he can take a student from here to there, from a belief in God or his country or whatever, to being an atheist and not believing in his country in one hour. Did he do that? Oh yeah, he does it. And I've seen it with students. I've seen it with young people. And they don't even know. And teachers don't even know. That's why if you talk to teachers about it often, they'll really have an awfully hard time dealing with it. And, and if you go up to a superintendent, an, administ an educational administrator, superintendent or whatever, and you ask him, or her, have you ever been through sensitivity training? They'll usually crack up because they went through it. They are the worst, those programs. I've, I've been through them. I mean, how can anything be worse than some of the ones that the regular classroom has, but they're the worst. What do they teach the children? To bring about change. They put them through role-playing, psychodrama, all these psychological techniques where they play the part of starving children and the, and the other one plays the part of a very wealthy industrialist child. and. You know, they bring about the attitude and value change through the emotions. You know how young people are. You know, they, they're naturally very altruistic and they want to help and they don't like to see poverty around the world. And so what they'll do is, just like I think I mentioned you earlier, or I, I don't know whether I did, uh, going into our, the teacher putting in the new social studies program in our community and walking through, having taking the little tots through town and identifying big, rich people's houses and small poor people's houses. Uh, that's a perfect example of what I'm talking about. Uh, getting them young and making them feel sorry for the people who live in the trailer across from the captain's house because they only eat hot dogs, not steak. And then they'll do the same thing with uh, Ethiopia or wherever, some third world country showing them the children dying. And then, and then they'll show pictures of our, our uh, affluence and what do you eat for breakfast? Oh, you have eggs and bacon and cereal and orange juice and grapefruit and everything. Yum, yum, yum. Do you really think it's fair? Common unity. That's what we call it. Common unity. It is no role for the individual in the community. And for everything that goes on in the Soviet Union, where communism is based on the community, the commune, 